Hey everybody, welcome back to 3D Fundamentals Tutorial 2. Today we're going to be talking about 3D space and, you know, 3D vectors, a whole bunch of dumb bullshit. But first things first, there was a mistake in the framework and I fixed it. So what was the mistake? Well, it was in the, uh, the two-dimensional matrix class, Mate 2. And the problem was the way that we were multiplying VEC2 by the matrix, the order was a little off. It sort of works, but it's sort of backwards. So to, uh, to make a long story short, what I was doing was basically multiplying like this. Multiply this, multiply this and add, you get this result. And then you multiply this and this and add, and you get this result. But that's not the way you're supposed to multiply, you know, matrices together. What you're supposed to be doing is this times this equals this, and this times this equals this. I mean, we should, I hope you know this already. And that's not what I was doing, because just for reasons, I changed some things, I didn't change some other things. So I switched it up, and now it's being multiplied fine. And if you want, you can, you can, you know, check this part of the uh, the branch out. By the way, uh, I guess I should have mentioned it, but we're on branch T2 VEC3 right now. Uh, so that's a tutorial 2 branch. You can check it out. If you view the history, you'll see here fixing order of VEC2 made to multiplication. You can create a branch here and check it out. All it does basically is the, the rotation of the star is going to be in the opposite direction. That's it. So I fix that and all is well. Now, take a look at this dumb bullshit here. We got what looks like, you know, a fairly basic 2D scene. You got a lot of uh, circles here. You can think of them as points or whatever. I don't care. But yeah, this is, this is 2D. Now you can think of 2D as existing inside of 3D space as a kind of a subset of 3D space. And you'll notice there that if you have a 2D world existing in 3D space, all the things in that world are all existing at the same on the same plane. So they all have the same Z value, right? Because we assume, in general, we say in 2D space, we give our axes the names X and Y. So in 3D space, you need an extra axis. We generally like to call it Z, continuing on with that trend. But what if we start giving our circles some different Z values? Then everything is no longer on the same plane. And as you can see now, our scene starts to have a little bit of depth. It's not flat. It's not 2D anymore. Now it's 3D. Because now our stuff has different Z values. I mean, I'm not going to insult your intelligence here, but that's the basics of 3D, right? You add another axis and you start putting things on that axis. Uh... Now, in order to do that, we are going to need to be able to store that extra information. So we're going to need to uh, evolve our VEC2s into VEC3s. Now, we could do this by creating a new independent uh, template class called VEC3 and giving it, you know, X, Y, and Z data and basically giving it the same operations as we had for VEC2. But what I prefer to do is to actually inherit from VEC2 and then just give an extra data for Z. So we inherit from VEC2, we inherit X and Y, and we add a Z. Now we're going to have to override all the operators for VEC2, so inheritance isn't going to give us any bonuses on that front. But what we, uh, what we can get is we'll be able to actually, well I'll show you later, but we'll be able to pass our VEC3s into functions that actually accept VEC2s and it'll all just work. So basically the way I went about this is I just copied all of the VEC2 class into VEC3 and then I, caught, I uh, find and replace VEC2 for VEC3, and I make VEC3 inherit from VEC2. And, you know, for the, for the operations, it's all pretty much straightforward. I mean, you just add a Z to whatever was there. So everything that had an X and Y, you just give it a Z, and it's all good. Things like uh, multiply here is defined based on, you know, multiply and assign, so you don't have, even have to change those at all. But you change all these other ones here, and everything's basically the same. Uh, the dot product for three dimensions is similar to the one for uh, two dimensions. You just also multiply the Z components of the two vectors together, and you add that. So not much, too much different. And to get the length 
of a vector. It's just your basic vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, and then you take the square root of that. Um, and I'm just calculating that basically by doing the dot product. So by multiplying the vector by itself, dot product, you get vx squared, vy squared, and then vz squared. That gives you the length squared. You take the square root of the length squared to give you the length. Not too complicated. The length of a 3D vector isn't that hard to figure out. You just take the length of the, uh, the x and the y part of the vector, which is this, and you use that plus the z part to get the length of the whole vector, which comes out to this. And that's basically it for 3D vectors. Now, if you got 3D vectors, you're going to also need 3D matrices in order to, you know, transform those vectors. And we can't do our inheritance bullshit with the matrix the way I have it set up because, you know, we've got these elements and they're in an array, so you can't just inherit and then, you know, make the array bigger. It doesn't work like that, right? You need to, when you inherit, you can add a new uh, data member, but you can't like change the size of the array. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. So the way we do this is I create a new mate three and this time I, I make the elements three by three. And all you basically got to change here is you got to change the uh, the matrix by matrix multiplication routine here where you've got your your three loops and you just make them you know loop up until three instead of up until two but otherwise you don't change anything there and down here you got to change the uh, vector by matrix multiplication so now you've got your three element vectors and you've got your uh, three by three matrix so it's going to look something like this the multiplication and you gotta, you know, you gotta redefine your identity matrix here. It's just ones in the diagonals. Uh, so you, you're adding another dimension here, so you've gotta put another one in here and more zeros. And same idea for scaling, only you replace the ones with the scaling factor. And nothing groundbreaking there. Now I did remove the rotation because rotation is a, it's a little trickier. It's not quite as straightforward. And I'm going to be giving rotation matrices their own video, which will be following this one. So there you go. You got your matrix, you got your vector, vec3, mate3, everything is good. Now, before we put our three-dimensional vectors and matrices into use, we've got to think about how we're going to set up our coordinate system, our world, or our camera space, or whatever the fuck you want to call it. And it turns out that there are a bunch of ways that you can do this. Uh, now, they can generally be grouped into two large groups, a uh, right-handed coordinate system and a left-handed coordinate system. The way we tell whether a coordinate system is left-handed or right-handed is you take your finger and you make this weird kind of sex move looking thing and in this situation we say our thumb is the x, our index finger is the y, and the fucker is the z. If you can orient it such that it matches up with your axes then you are that handedness. So if you left hand like this and if that lines up with the axes then you've got a left handed system. If it doesn't you got a right handed system. You can make your right hand line up with that. Maybe you got to twist it around, dislocate your wrist, but it'll work. Generally these a system will choose one of these so for example here we look uh, 3d studio max it uses a right-handed system unity uses left-handed unreal engine uses left-handed and uh in terms of apis uh direct 3d uses left-handed and uh open gl is right-handed why can't they all pick the same convention who the fuck knows but there you have it now we're going to be doing left-handed because we're eventually going to be moving on to direct 3d so ours is going to be like this now you can the same left-handed system you can have it in a bunch of different ways look at unreal engine this is left-handed z is up but unity is left-handed y is up now in our situation uh, from the perspective of our screen space or our eye space or whatever you want to call it uh, We're going to be creating a system like this where Y is up X is to the right and Z is going into the screen or Coming out of the back of the screen if you like and that's how we're going to think of our space now this is different than our 2d space not only in that we have a z-axis but also in that now y is going to be pointing up instead of pointing down but yeah you got left-handed you got right-handed you got 
hand jobs all around look at this look at this guy he's giving this one a real he's about to give this one a, this x-axis a real good time you can just tell all right now that we have an idea for the axes let's talk about the space that we're actually going to be working in so we're going to have y up x to the right z going into the screen now one question is where to put the origin where is zero zero going to be on the screen when we put a pixel at zero zero or a line at or a pixel at say zero 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 where does that fit on the screen now an obvious idea for someone coming from 2d is yeah zero zero goes in the top left but it turns out that having zero zero at the top left ain't so great uh, because for example let's say you're gonna scale something you've got something in the middle of the screen and you want to scale it if your origin is here and you multiply by a scaling you're going to get it to it's gonna scale basically like this it's gonna not only grow bigger but it's also gonna grow farther away from the origin so what we like to do is stick the origin now in the middle of the screen like this it makes scaling a lot nicer it's just a, overall it's a much better deal to put the origin in the center of the screen now another question might be what to put as the extents of the screen uh, so what is the uh, the coordinate of the x coordinate of say the far right or the far left and you might say well let's just make it as you know the dimensions of the screen in pixels divided by two so if we have an 800 by 600 this would be negative 400 and this would be positive 400 and that's okay but what happens is in 3d graphics um, what they generally do is they make the uh, the coordinates normalized and what that means basically is everything is going from negative one to positive one so negative one now means the far left and positive one means the far right and that is independent of the screen size so no matter what the screen size is you know where the far left and the far right is you don't have to go referring that's always going to be negative one and positive one and the same thing for y you're going to make this one negative one and positive one in the y direction and this is generally called normalized device coordinates and they have various nice properties which is cool but the main reason why i'm going to use them is because that's what direct 3d and opengl use so you better fucking get used to them now in direct 3d there is something called ndc space and it's basically like i showed you x and y negative one to positive one and z from zero to positive one so it's actually a kind of half cube in opengl it's actually a full cube but we won't worry about that now in our situation we're not going to worry about z for the time being we'll get to z later so we're not going to have true ndc space for a number of reasons for example uh, ndc space is actually uses four-dimensional vectors but we're only using three-dimensional vectors i thought of calling the space that we're going to use pc3 space which would be pre-clip three-dimensional space but then i thought why don't i just call it pube space because it's kind of like a cube but pube you know because because pube so we're gonna call this pube space what we're working in and it's basically just x and y between uh negative one and positive one z is wherever the fuck you want z to be because freedom and and we'll probably update this as we go in the very in the end we're gonna have the same set of spaces that direct 3d has so all the spaces that direct 3d uses the world space and the object space and the view space slash camera space all that dumb space shit but in the beginning we're going to keep it simple we're just going to have pube space good old pube space now we're going to need some way of transforming vertices from pube space into screen space so i have created a class called the pube screen transformer and its job is take in vertices and transform them it has two methods one will transform the vertex uh, by mutating it and the other one will transform vertex it won't actually mutate it it'll return the transformed version of it and the math for this is you know it's not that complicated i'm sure you could figure it out but i'm going to just go into it here for a second so let's say you want to take a point from pube space where we'll take the origin to start with and you want to transform it into screen space so what you're going to do is well first off pube space is a lot smaller than screen space because pube space only runs from you know negative one to positive one 
So let's just look at the x-axis to begin with, because the, the x and the y, they're the same. So you want to transform this x uh, coordinate from pube space into screen space. What are you going to do? Well, first you're going to have to scale that coordinate into the same size as screen space. So pube space is width is 2, and screen space is width is going to be w. So how do you transform from 2 into w? You multiply by w over 2, because 2 times w over 2 equals w. So here, first transformation is you're going to have to multiply by w over 2. So we'll take our x times w over 2, and that should be equal to our screen space, only it isn't, because let's say, let's take 0. 0 times w over 2 is 0. That would be here. So obviously, you, it's not just multiply by w over 2. You also have to move it from here down to here, right? Because in pube space, our origin is at the center, but in screen space, it's at the top left. So add and we're transforming just to Z, so we're going from here to here. So add W over 2. So multiply by W over 2 and then add W over 2. And if you do that, you're going to get your transformation. And what you can do then is you can factor out W over 2. So it's just X plus 1 times W over 2. And if you look at the code, here you have... We, we're uh, initializing X factor with width over 2, and then we're just having x plus 1 times w over 2, x factor. Now for the y, it's almost the exact same, only you have to, uh, you have to negate the y because we're flipping the axes, right? I mean, pube space y is up, screen space y is down, so you gotta flip the y first. But otherwise, it's exactly the same. And there you go, you've got your pube space transformer all set up. Now, we want, we're, we're all raring to go, we've set up a bunch of shit. We want to test out our uh, bullshit. So what we're going to draw is we're going to draw a cube. So our cube is going to look something like this. We're going to have it centered at the origin here. And the vertices are just going to be, you know, uh, well, if the cube's dimensions is, you know, the size is 1, then you're going to have negative 5, negative 5, negative 5, and then on the opposite corner, you're going to have positive 5, positive 5, positive 5. By 5, I mean 0. 0.5. And all the other kinds of permutations of that negative and positive bullshit. And that is how you get all the points on your cube. Um, so we're going to create a data structure that is basically just going to hold all of these different vertices for the cube. And that is done right here in cube.h. So we have a vector of vec3s. It's confusing, but this is a container. This is a mathematical vector. We know this. And in the constructor here, we're just going to in place a bunch of vec3s into the vector. And it's just, so if we give a size parameter to the constructor, it is going to divide that by two and then do all the negative positive permutations to get our eight vectors, our eight corners of our cube. Now, we want to be able to draw the cube and to start off, we're gonna use wireframe drawing like this diagram here. Now, so <clears throat> that means we're gonna have to draw four, four, 12 lines. Uh, now, how we represent those lines is an important question. We could represent those lines as a list of vertices. Uh, every line has two vertices, so 12 times 2, we would need 24 vertices. And that's fine, so we could create, we could output a vector of 24 vertices, which represent pairs of vertices for the endpoints of our lines that we want to draw. Uh, the problem with that is we have to now transform all 24 of those vertices. So for example, we want to draw this line, we've got to transform this vertex and this vertex. And if we want to try to draw this line, we've got to transform this vertex and this vertex. You see what I'm getting at here? We got to transform every vertex three times, which is waste because every transformation result is going to be identical. So instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to output a, uh, a container, a vertex, of our eight vertices. Did I say vertex? I meant vector. We're going to output a vector of our 
eight vertices and then we're going to output another vector and that's going to have the indexes into the vector of vertices so now we say okay line one here let's say this is uh, vertex zero one two three so line one this line here is going to be zero one and then the next line here is going to be zero three so we have a container of indices and a container of vertices and this will allow us to only now we only have to perform the transformation on eight vertices and then we can reuse those vertices uh, by the instructions from our index buffer and this is how uh, primitives are drawn in direct 3d that's the most common way you have an index buffer and you have a vertex buffer and the index buffer tells you which vertices are used to draw which triangles so what I've gone ahead and done here is I've created a type it's just a basic struct and it's called indexed line list and you're gonna have a vector of vertices and a vector of indices indices are just size t it's just it's just an unsigned int right then we have a function called get lines and all it does is it copies the vertices into a what do you call that thing index line list and then it uh, puts these index values into the index uh, vector and these values represent these vertices here so this is saying the first line is from 0 to 1 and the second line is from uh, 1 to 3 and the third line is from 3 to 2 and whatever it's just it's all just based on this diagram here and these indexes will uh, create 12 lines for us that will represent a cube all right enough cock teasing now it's time for what you want hot hot wireframe 3d action so what we're going to do is well, let me show you here and we're going to include cube and cube screen transformer into uh, game.h and we're going to add a cube screen transformer and a cube to our game and then we're going to initialize the cube with the size of one and then every frame in compose frame we you know we generate our uh, what do you call it, our index line list and we transform every vertex in the list to screen space and then we go we uh, iterate through the indices from the start to the end um, advancing by two every uh, iteration not by one but by two and that's going pairwise because every line is a pair of two vertices and then we index into the vertices from those uh, indices that we are iterating through so we go iterator index at the iterator i and the index at the uh, the next iterator or the next position of the iterator and we use those indices to index into our vertices and then we grab our testes and we draw a line at those two vertices or between those two vertices with the color white because why the fuck not and if you run that it looks something like this and you might say well first of all doesn't look 3d but first of all it's not a fucking cube because it's wider than it is tall what the fuck chili well remember we're drawing this motherfucking thing in pube space and pube space is from negative one to positive one in both the uh the x and the y directions so in pube space x and y the same size but when you map that to the actual screen because the screen isn't square you're going to get stretching in the width now there are a bunch of ways we can handle this it's not too complicated but we are going to take the coward's way out so what we're going to do here is so here's the branch i'm we're at right now and i just created this branch for the video it doesn't exist in the repo and if we switch over to the branch that's in the repo t2 vec3 switch over to this branch and then we head over to game.cpp uh, well, we see that this has changed. I'll talk about this later. But if we go into graphics.h, we see that I have changed the screen width and the screen height to both be 640. So I have made the screen square so that now we won't have that distortion. 
definitely the coward's way out. I'm just avoiding the problem. And there's a reason for this. It's not like it's that difficult to solve. It's just that the way we're going to solve it later on is we're going to use something called a transformation matrix, but I'm not ready to introduce that right now. So I don't want to introduce some half-assed solution just to replace it later. It's very simple. We're just going to work with a square screen for the time being, for quite a while. And when the time comes, I will introduce the tech that you need so you can have a screen of any kind of aspect ratio. So yeah, for now on, for now at least, for now, for now, for now, for now, we are going to be 640 by 640. And the other thing I did here doesn't actually mean anything, but I did it anyways. And holy shit, fucking loud outside. Anyways, so I'm transforming, I'm translating every vertex uh, by one in the Z direction. And that's basically just doing, let me see if I can get it, it's just doing this, it's sliding the box uh, somewhere around here. Because if you think about it, if our camera is starting at the origin, as we sort of imagine it is, we don't want to have our box half in front of and half behind the camera. Basically, we'd be inside the box. Not a good solution, not a good situation. Now, it doesn't matter in our current situation because we're basically just ignoring Z, but we won't be ignoring Z forever. But yeah, here is the result. Here's our drawn cube, which looks surprisingly like a 2D square, or not surprising if you think about it. Because what we're doing is we're just saying, okay, well, we're drawing to a two-dimensional space. Two-dimensional space only has X and Y. So we're ignoring the Zs right now and drawing like this. And this is what you get. And it's called orthographic projection. I'll talk about it later. But basically, in order to visualize 3D, you need a bunch of different stuff. And I like to call these things your, your 3D visual cues. And the whole one of the themes of this series is going to be adding one at a time 3D visual cues to our repertoire. And as we add more visual cues, our, our scenes are going to look more and more 3D. Right now, as it stands, our brains would not normally interpret this as a cube. But in terms of the mathematics, it is a cube, three-dimensional and all that. Uh, it's just we don't have those 3D cues to tell our brain that, oh shit, this is 3D after all. And that'll about do it for today. Let me know in the comments what you think about the series so far, any insights or comments or questions. And if you like the video, please click the like button, it helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more 3D fundamentals.